Um, thank you, Eric, for the introduction. And uh, as Eric said, the topic of today's talk is using Sparrow to model total nitrogen sources and transport in rivers and streams of California. And as Eric mentioned, um, some of you may have uh, been at our presentation last year when we had um, first started work on the model. And last year, all we could really do in our presentation was to give you an idea as to uh, what Sparrow was all about and um, what we wanted to uh, hope to accomplish with this in California. And since then, um, we've, done, we've made quite a bit of progress on this. We still have some work to do, but we're going to be presenting what we have um, to date. So, um, since everybody on the call was, um, um, everybody on today's call was at our meeting last year, I'm going to start off the presentation by giving you a little bit of background on what Barrow does and what, what, what it can do. Um, and then uh, Dina's going to take over and um, show what kind of results we've had with our modeling to date. So here's an outline of our presentation. What is the Sparrow model uh, applications of Sparrow for California? Uh, some of the data sets that we used for the calibration, uh, some of the nitrogen sources and loads, and some of the further work and model refinement that we are going to do. Um, go on tonight. So SPARE is an acronym for Spatially Reference Regression on Watershed Attributes. So basically, um, what that means is that for a given region or a given watershed, typically what you're going to have is um, some portions of a stream or some sites on a stream are going to have a gauging station where uh, discharge is monitored year-round. And some of those discharge state, those, um, flow monitoring stations, we're also going to get um, chemistry data, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, or whatever, whatever con constituent might be uh, monitored. Um, but in the watershed, wherever you go, um, most of the watershed is not going to be monitored. So you're only going to have a few uh, monitoring sites for flow and you're, and you're probably going to have even fewer for water quality. Um, and in most of the studies that, uh, or many of the studies that we do, um, these days, such as for TMDLs or whatever, we, we get an idea of what's happening in the entire watershed, particularly for compounds such as nitrogen and phosphorus, because they are sourced from natural sources, such as forested areas, rangeland, and also have uh, anthropogenic sources, such as fertilizer, the use of manure. So um, what we do at USGS, and this effort actually started um, quite a few years ago, more than a decade ago, uh, we asked the question, how can we do a whole watershed model on constituent transport? Because we're always just going to have a few of these monitoring sites, but yet we want to do um, analyses on entire watersheds. And what it was realized was that what we could do was to get information on um, potential sources of these uh, constituents throughout a watershed. So we can look at, we can get information on all the fertilizer that was used. We can get information on um, nitrogen being deposited by the atmosphere. We could also get other types of information um, throughout the entire watershed, such as geohydrology, um, flow, uh, permeability, uh, groundwater recharge, uh, and et cetera. And so putting all that, and, and then we also have different equations that we could use that have been developed through um, people working in uh, biogeochemistry, such as how these constituents might move from land um, to water. And we could put that all together um, into a model to predict um, how sources, how hydrogen or phosphorus starting or any other constituent um, from a particular source move from land to water and once it reaches water, how it's going to be transported down to a receiving body of water. So um, as you'll see as we go through the talk, uh, what we can use this model for is to look at incremental loads and yields um, um, that originate within a given watershed and how those loads um, are transported um, down to a receiving body and how, how the mass will change as that um, water moves down through the um, down through the system. And it's so important to realize that when we build these models, we have to build them around a specific year. So what we have to do then is to get the um, uh, the sources that were put on the land sources on land surface throughout that year. Uh, this with the um, climate data, 
um, and the same with the uh, hydrological information. So this model that we're building for California, we're simulating the year 2001. And um, 2001, more than a decade ago, uh, but in part this 2001 uh, was what was chosen by the U.S. Geological Survey um, to do a national model. And so we've been using these models uh, throughout the country. Um, so we've uh, successfully modeled areas like the Chesapeake Bay, um, the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River Basin. Um, and California was the last location in the United States to receive funding from the USGS to build these models. So um, um, we had the data sets all in hand for 2001, and that is the year that, that, we're, um, that we're using for this model. Uh, also works on average flow conditions, so this isn't really the type of model to um, look at storm surges or things like that. So um, just keep that in mind as well. So as I said, so some of the goals for the Sparrow model for California are understanding the loads and yields from unmonitored stream reaches throughout the state. We see what understand the factors that affect the transport of nitrogen and phosphorus. And then for specific downstream water bodies, such as the delta, we see like what the loads are coming into the delta, for example, and we can do this for other watersheds throughout the state once the model is complete, and then look upstream and, see, and be able to predict what are the potential source areas and look at, at what, are the, what are the specific contributing watersheds or even stream segments that contribute these loads um, down to the, um, to the delta or whatever downstream source that we're looking at. Um, so going on to the next slide. So um, uh, this is our location for our, um, our study. So as I mentioned, we're doing this for almost the entire state of California and uh, a small portion of um, so a small portion of Oregon, which is the Klamath Basin up to the north, and these small areas of um, in the and uh, on this slide, um, it shows what some of our calibration sites were, the distribution of them. And um, I plotted this relative to uh, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency ecoregions for nutrients uh, management, uh, Western Forested Mountains, um, the uh, Willamette and Central Valleys, that is, that is it is called, and the um, Zero West. Um, so the distribution of sling sites um, is what we found for the year 2001. Um, there are probably some other sources of data that, um, that we can still get together some of these calibration sites, but these were, these were the sites that we found. And for these sites that we found for calibration, they, as I mentioned, they had, to have, they had to have been monitored around the year 2001, so that we had a window of opportunity before 2001, after 2001. And we also needed to have enough data on these sites to fit these to a load model. So that was part of the uh, calibration process, was to develop a regression between load, uh, I mean, between concentration and stream discharge to be able to uh, predict um, the flux. And then at each of those calibration sites, both load models had to be um, examined statistically to make sure that um, the loads that we're predicting are um, in fact um, within um, an acceptable level of uh, error. So that's where our calibration sites are. Um, what we then do is uh, we calibration sites and then we have to link them to um, a stream network. And what we currently are using is the, um, is the National Hydrography Database version 2, which recently became available. And on this slide, um, this is. Um, of what it looks like. So for California, we're divided up into uh, 178,000 different watersheds. And watersheds are shown in this slide. They're uh, basically um, um, small watersheds, which then can be aggregated to a larger catchment, like the Sacramento River Basin, the San Joaquin Basin, the Klamath, or whatever. In um, blue are shown the natural watersheds, and orange are lines with uh, are shown the, uh, the watersheds or the streams that are not really defined, and these are some of the canals and whatnot that uh, deliver irrigation water, take your, or take um, irrigation drainage off the fields and whatnot. So that's um, from, um, um, those are shown on this slide. 
So basically what we end up with then is 178,000 different watersheds. And within these watersheds, each one is assigned um, a, a, a specific amount of, of a source, whether it be nitrogen or phosphorus. It's assigned a discharge. Those charges, which are not part of a monitoring station, um, have been estimated with a model, once again, based on average flow conditions as they would have um, occurred in the year 2001. And one has assigned with these different geological um, parameters, such as soil permeability, soil, um, um, and so on. And so I think on the next slide, um, yeah. So, so one of the first things that we do on this is obtain our chemistry and discharge data. We need some of our chemistry data from U.S. Geological Survey, the California Department of Water Resources, University of California, Davis, and a large retrieval out of the Storat database. And then our discharge data uh, obtained, of course, from USGS and California DWR sources. So one of these were uh, uh, specific for the 2001 and modeling uh, total nitrogen and total phosphorus. So we had to get uh, make sure the data that we that we attained were efficient to be able to define what total nitrogen and total phosphorus are. And these sort of are the are the basic layers that we have that are assigned to each one of those 178,000 different uh, watersheds. So we have flow index. I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, basically you can see what we have here. Some things that uh, are of importance: nutrient applications by fertilizer. We have uh, manure applications. Um, we have um, base flow index, precipitation, bedrock geology, um, average stream flow, and so on and so forth. So, uh, Dean talk about this a little bit more. But as we build a model, what we try to do then, after we um, have all of our calibration sites in, is to determine which one of these different layers are statistically significant for uh, determining. Uh, of are statistically significant for our calibration. From our calibration, then we can go on to the prediction mode. Um, this is just uh, a simple slide to show uh, what some of our nitrogen data look like throughout the state and how it varies in these different ecoregions. Um, the white is a little bit difficult to read here, but basically um, these boxes show what the nitrogen data look like in these different ecoregions. Surprisingly, the western forested mountains have the um, least amount of total nitrogen. Uh, the nitrogen in those um, uh, parts of the state are cycled through um, basically natural processes, atmospheric, de atmospheric deposition, uptake by the trees, and then decomposition by the leaf litter. And then as you go into the Willamette and Central Valleys, our, um, our nitrogen loads are, uh, are much higher. Um, and um, into the desert areas, and um, nitrogen loads are somewhat similar to what we see in the Willamette and Central Valleys. We also plotted uh, on these slides what the uh, nitrogen concentration, total nitrogen concentrations are relative to um, the EA standards based on reference conditions. And what it shows that even the western forested mountains, most of those streams are actually above what we're currently seeing on these uh, current management targets. And as we go to different parts of the state, the types of nitrogen um, that are transported actually change. So um, on, the, on the right, on the right, what we have is um, um, a ratio of uh, nitrate to uh, total nitrogen. So in the western forested mountains, um, most of the nitrogen that's transported to the streams is in the form of organic nitrogen. So the uh, ratio of nitrate to uh, the total nitrogen is the median is about 0 0.1. And then as we move to the Central Valley, that ratio changes quite a bit, and it's about um, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 as a, a median concentration because of all the fertilizer that's applied as nitrate. And then as we go to the zero west, um, that form of um, um, nitrate as a um, total of the uh, a percentage of the um, total nitrogen changes. So the, the types of nitrogen then change throughout the state, and we have to keep that in mind when we consider our biogeochemistry because these are different types of nitrogen that are being uh, transported to these streams. Um, and um, this is just a box plot showing some of our, our loads. Um, once again, um, 
total loads using Fluxmaster, which Fluxmaster is a program which regresses uh, stream concentration against um, discharge um, to produce a mass loading for the year. And then, not surprisingly, our um, total loads in the Central Valley because of the fertilizer usage then is much higher than what we see in the western forested mountains and even higher um, than in the Zurich West. And um, this shows a slide of our total nitrogen uh, at our different calibration sites um, are based on tons per year. And it shows like where some of the stream segments um, um, uh, increase in total nitrogen. It's kind of seen quite clearly down in the San Joaquin Valley when we start up uh, in, um, uh, like down in the salt slough, mud slough area, and we proceed up to uh, uh, Vernalis we can see that this, these loads of nitrogen increasing in a downstream manner. And you kind of see that also as we proceed down the, um, down the Sacramento River. This part of the talk uh, is running Sparrow. And, uh, uh, change, uh, switch the presentation off to uh, Dina right now. And uh, she'll show you some of the results that we've had um, to date on this uh, calibration and prediction. OK. Uh, Dina, uh, Dina Saleh. So I'm working with Joe on this project, and uh, I will sh be uh, showing you some um, information about some of the results that we got for the total nitrogen model. Um, we haven't. Uh, we're in the process of building the TP, the total phosphorus model, but we haven't gotten there yet. That's why we didn't present it today. So the total once been all those. Um, back a little bit uh, to show slide. Once again, all our spatial layers are, that are connected to our catchments in our watersheds and our NHD plus um, uh, flow lines, uh, we have to determine, we, ha we, we would put the model in what's called the calibration mode. Uh, that's the first process of running the Sparrow model. In the calibration mode, basically, we would go through some of these different uh, param or data, data sets or parameters that we bring into the model and try to see how significant they are uh, in the model. And we would basically, we need to look at, identify three types of sources. Um, first, or, uh, first type of sources is our, uh, our first type of uh, parameter is our sources. And we tried uh, many different uh, uh, layers and our data sets and came up with these five uh, the that is being our main sources uh, for uh, total nitrogen in our study. Um, these are fertilizer and confined manure, confined manure, uh, forest land, uh, developed land, and point sources. And later in the talk, I'll be talking about these sources in more detail as I relate them to the results of Sparrow uh, and how Sparrow, how well Sparrow uh, was able to model the loads from these sources. Uh, the uh, the parameter, uh, a source parameter is considered significant uh, with having a value by applying a, um, a statistical test, uh, the uh, one side the T test, and the value of 0.1 is considered significant. Um, so you see here that we have the forest land uh, per square area is the most significant source variable for our study. Um, our, our next uh, parameter would be our delivery uh, variable. And what we used here is a water delivery uh, parameter. And what we, use, what we were able to come with after running a whole bunch of different uh, possibilities is the, the percent sand per square area. Is, um, the significance of a delivery variable is uh, uh, decided by running a two-sided uh, t-test and a significant uh, a parameter would have a, a p-value of uh, less than 0.05. Uh, uh, next slide is going to show um, how uh, the, uh, uh, a distribution of our percent sand. Uh, this is basically a surrogate for permeability, but when I use permeability by itself as a delivery variable, it, it was not significant in the model. So using percent sand per square area, uh, shows as being a significant uh, land to water delivery variable. You can see this area to the uh, east, uh, mostly a lot of uh, you know a high percentage of sand in the soils uh, compared to the, to the clay sands in the around Central Valley. 
and this kind of affects the transport of nutrients through uh, to the uh, to this uh, water through the uh, Our uh, third uh, parameter is our um, decay aquatic loss and aquatic uh, loss. Uh, very important, the removal of nutrients uh, in uh, watershed uh, through um, um, uh, uh, particle settling, algal uptake, and uh, benthic uh, denitrification and other uh, processes is very important. Um, uh, in the Sparrow model, um, the removal uh, is estimated using a first order decay process that is fun as a function of the time of travel for each reach divide uh, 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 the travel of each reach within different stream flow classes and in our study we divided our stream flows into three classes we have the perennial streams um, small perennial streams that have flow less than uh, 500 cfs and large perennial streams uh, higher than 500 CFS and our intermittent streams. And uh, uh, our uh, aquatic loss uh, parameter is considered uh, significant through uh, 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 two-sided statistical t-test and a value of 0 0.05 is, uh, is considered significant. So you hear that our, our small perennial streams and our inter uh, intermittent streams are highly significant for our area. In general, uh, uh, through the calibration uh, phase of the model, uh, the, or the result of our calibration, gives us a pretty good, you know, acceptable model. Our um, R square 0.89, uh, RMS uh, of uh, 0.67. Uh, um, this is all calibrating to 79 uh, calibration sites uh, for total nitrogen in the study area. Um, there are attempts now to uh, kind of obtain more calibration sites, which will kind of be uh, give us a better result and be able to kind of cover more area. Uh, we haven't been able to uh, get that data yet, so it's been a work in progress, and I will talk about it in the later on in the future, our future work, what we're planning on doing is adding more water quality sites. So now since we have done our calibration and we're comfortable with the model, we're going to move into our prediction. Um, and with the prediction mode, uh, we're going to be able to use the coefficients related to each one of those uh, model parameters to estimate loads in our catchments and watersheds, or 100, 178,000 watersheds, uh, even in areas that are uh, unengaged. So we'll be able to come up with a load value for those watersheds. Uh, so we, once we, we, so we, we basically, we, you, you, you decide on your parameters, you're happy with your model, you're happy with your uh, and all your variables, and then you lock that model and run it into a prediction mode. And the prediction mode will result in a lot of information, and some of it, uh, I'm going to show you the, uh, uh, some of the information that's available. So this slide, I'm, I'm showing you here, to the left is my source. So there's like source and load. So this is the source that we, we used in our calibration. And to the right is the modeled, the sparrow modeled load related to that source. This is per catchment or per shed. It's not, uh, uh, so it's incremental. It's not basically looking at the what the what being moved downstream to the water bodies. So you see that, uh, for and uh, confined manure uh, data we, we obtained um, uh, from, it um, was compiled uh, by the U.S. Geological Survey looking at um, um, fertilizer sale, uh, sales um, and uh, animal uh, population. Uh, I think it's a, a data set. And put it together, compiled it to, uh, for us, and gave it to us as one of a layer, as two separate layers. And I combined them together because both of these are being applied to the same. Uh, uh, land cover, which is the, or land use type, which is the um, um, uh, row crop. And uh, see here to the right, the model does pretty well, a good job in uh, representing uh, the loads uh, from these different sources. These sources. Uh, the key value uh, of this of the uh, this source is uh, 0 0.01. 
And remember, I said that there needs to be lower than point of, uh, point 0.1. So this is considered a significant uh, source. My next is uh, talking about showing uh, the unconfined manure apply also to row crops, and uh, but at the same time they apply it to uh, grasslands. So um, you see more application of it uh, here uh, in the. Uh, and then also the model was significant at 0.05, and well represented the uh, you know the location of application. Third variable uh, is the land uh, developed land, and the way it is provided is, uh, through um, uh, the national land cover uh, data set for 2001, which is the data set we use in this model. Uh, the developed land is divided into three uh, different categories, and I uh, like for low intensity, where uh, only uh, uh, 20 to uh, 20, what is my number? 20 to 50 percent of land uh, is impervious uh, surface. High, uh, medium intensity, which is like between. Um, uh, 50, 70 to 80 percent is uh, impervious, and then the intensity, which is mostly like where uh, people reside in a lot of cities and population, and, and uh, it's 80 to 100 percent impervious uh, uh, surface. And so I combine all those into one uh, one parameter, and I'm running in the model. And you have to understand, I I went through the process of each one of these very separately, and sometimes kind of uh, throw the other in the model. So we order to have them all be significant. I put them into one uh, uh, parameter, and they came up as significant as uh, 0 0.05. Um, and the uh, uh, Sparrow was able, really, to capture uh, this uh, uh, source very well. My final source is, uh, no, actually, I have uh, also uh, forest lands, also from uh, the National Land Use uh, Data Set of 2001. This is my most, uh, the highest significant uh, source of a 0 0.001 p-value. Um, and my final source is from point sources. And point sources, um, very, it's, it's a place by itself. Uh, I remember talking to you about this last year. I don't know if you remember the details we went through, but we were to obtain loads from point sources, uh, we would have to we had to go through obtaining uh, uh, discharge information, effluent discharge information, and when available, uh, concentration information from uh, different facilities. Um, the, uh, some, we sometimes we had to go actually to to the to, to the facilities themselves. We we got them from different databases from EPA, um, control board uh, offices through uh, the NPDES uh, permit. Uh, uh, requirement number, we had to get that information of uh, effluent discharge. And then we were able to get about 285 um, uh, points that were mostly wastewater treatment plants. Uh, most of them are majors. A major uh, facility is anything that uh, basically um, about uh, 100, more than a million, one million gallons per day. Um, and then with a few miners. Um, but if you look at the map to the left, you see most of our point sources are, and I'm sorry if you can't, if it's not very clear, but the, they're the small blackish kind of dots. And they're mostly by the coast, uh, downstream of our uh, Caliban sites, which are the red circles. I'm not sure this is very clear on this map. That's why, you know, that's why a lot of these, because of their location, a lot of them were not very used very much in the model. So the, the uh, point source itself was not as significant as it should be, uh, or it could be. I mean, you see the p-value is 0 0.078. Um, okay. Okay. Finally, the final slide, this slide uh, shows uh, um, Output from Sparrow and Sparrow here to the left shows you the total nitrogen load for all the study from all these different sources. This is like I said before, it's incremental. It's per watershed. It's not really what's going down to the water bodies downstream. Uh, 
industry. Um, the here to the uh, right is the yield, and that's also uh, the, the the sparrow also provide gives you uh, the total yield, incremental yield per catchment, and this is good to know because it was basically the load by the area, and then then you can um, use that information uh, to look at different sources um, and diff uh, that are you know. Um, that are normalized for by area. Um, and I said our model is pretty good. It has an R square value of 0.89, which is at this point of our study we're not really complete uh, done with it, and it was pretty we're pretty comfortable with it at this point. Okay, this shows the total nitrogen loads in the study area in California uh, from the different sources. Um, and you could see fertilizer and manure accounts for almost 50% of the load in California, uh, incrementally. Yeah. Um, point sources are 8%, and forest land is 42%. This accounts also for, uh, it's like a, a, a for atmospheric deposition, which it was not uh, in included in the middle here. Um, uh, but was uh, was also considered and not found significant in the model, but it's accounted for for the for, by the forest land. Um, and this is my most favorite slide I wanted to show you. Basically, one of the tools that are available with Sparrow is you can basically track down your route from the headwaters to the outlet by uh, by a river mile. And figure out the different sources that the load comes from. Um, this is the Sacramento River Basin, and the Sacramento River is right there. And this uh, here, the line figure, is basically showing the Sacramento River Basin from the headwaters to the outlet. And you see that these are the different sources of the load. Come, uh, from you know, or, or three source, or four source, or five sources. Sorry. So you see here, the red line is from the forest land, and if you could look at the map here, the forest land kind of starts dropping as you get out of the lowest dropping as you get out of the forested area at dredging, and then uh, fertilizer and manure starts picking up once you start getting into the Central Valley. Um, Urban load is not very uh, high in, in, this, in, the, in this river, so you see it's, uh, you have a case, you can almost kind of see where the main cities come in. So you can see uh, Sacramento right there. Uh, so point sources you can see, you know, going up as you get closer to the facilities. And this can be done to every watershed in your study area, so you can help. You know, you can use this as a tool to identify the main sources of certain loads. So you're looking at the different sources uh, in your watershed, and it kind of helps you kind of with management. Decide, you know, um, I want to show also the San Joaquin River. And this is a slight story where you have also, you know, the forest area comes up with the highest load in the, in the waters, and the fertilizer kicks in. Um, and where there is being applied in Central Valley for uh, agriculture. This is also, you know, from River um, Mile from headwaters to uh, to the outlet. So, what is our future plans uh, for this model in California? First, we're planning on uh, building a uh, total phosphorus model. I have all the data available. It's just some time I'm putting it together. Uh, it's quite an intense process. Um, it's um, you know we, all the layers have to be set together and and brought in and imported into the model. And so where this is our next uh, plan, uh, plan our next model is to build the California uh, total phosphorus model. Uh, we're going to incorporate the top basin into the California Sparrow model. Uh, the basin. Is all, at this at this point now is included in the um, what's called MRB seven. Actually, this is wrong. MRB six Sparrow model, um, 
or a Mark VI study area, there is no SPARO module for that study area at this point. Uh, because of the high interest in this area, um, could compare uh, the model results to um, the research uh, that's going on with the, in the, in the Tahoe Basin. We could, uh, you know, there's a high interest in, in having Tahoe be part of the California SPARO model. Uh, when we add Tahoe, we're going to um, and basically bring in 13 water quality sites that are in a, um, that give us a kind of a, a calibration sites in a, a different setting, or, or like in the, more in the mountain areas, and um, that will help us in kind of looking at that sources in, in our uh, California model. So that plan, and that also is, a, is in progress. I have all the data for this uh, watershed is basically just kind of putting it together. In this, and actually, in fact, it's almost as of putting together a complete model, standalone model by itself, and then combining it to a California model. So we could look to uh, look at them together. Um, also, if I'm a server, uh, we have just kind of made some new contacts recently, and we'll be, we're hopefully, we're hoping to add in some new uh, calibration size. And, River diversions into the model. Um, um, uh, on, and this kind of brings me brings me up to refine our model by adding no uh, more river diversions. River diversions in the model uh, allows you to put in river diversions uh, in the places where you know the water is being removed, and then with that, of course, the load is being removed. And this really uh, very, very uh, interesting. At this point, um, the any data set that we base our model on does not have uh, most of these diversions incorporated into the uh, data set. Uh, in order for us to account for what's going on, and, uh, we need to uh, incorporate these uh, diversions. And for so far, we have like 11 of them, um, 11 of the major diversions in the model, but then we're, we're planning on adding more of them and, and uh, Really affects the, the loads and affect the model output and um, model uh, uh, physical capabilities. So that's our plan to add them in. And um, we want to look at the, also Sparrow allows you to look at to link it, to link the loads from Delta or any other watershed to upstream sources. Uh, that's also something we want to work on uh, next and look at it in more. Uh, here more detail. Okay. Um, and we are in the process of kind of putting all this to work into some uh, publications. Uh, at this point, we are planning at least two publications. They're uh, part of a, a national uh, uh, for to the, where the, these publications are put into uh, journal articles and describing our t TN and TP model. Um, should be that, that's one thing we're going to be working on uh, very soon, and that should be available probably by next year. Um, once paper, the uh, models are published, uh, then we are able to develop what's called um, the uh, California Sparrow Decision Support System. Uh, this is the um, what is that? Mm -hmm. This is a, basically a web-based uh, model. Basic under uh, the underlining uh, model is the spare as your spare as your documented spare model. And it allows the user uh, to, um, to kind of get throughout the, the study area and uh, kind of look at different sources for unengaged watersheds, um, transport and. Uh, Helping in, in uh, uh, like for the management decisions. This is um, uh, a tool that was developed by the, the U.S. Geological Survey, and um, it will be available uh, for our study area once our models are documented and published. Um, I'm planning on um, presenting a lot of. Uh, these results and, and more details also in the uh, Benta uh, conference. Uh, I think if I think in October now, October. And that's all. I have. 
Thank you, thank you Joe. This is Eric. I have uh, some questions that were sent via chat. Uh, I will give those to you. For those that uh, send me your question, uh, please hold on to those. We'll get to them. You can, you can unmute star six, or you can send the question via chat to our presenter. Okay. Our set of questions. And these to you, uh, so you have those online, Dina. Mobility of the total in model, a program that uh, must be loaded on a person's PC or is it web based, and any user select inputs or find the spatial area of interest. So at this point, the the the, the TM model is is actually not available. Uh, to the public, it's a, a work in progress. We're still uh, trying uh, to, you know, complete. Uh, like I said, add in more calibration sites, uh, look at other uh, variables, and once it is completely approved, printed, and published, then what will happen. It will be going into uh, this that I was talking about. Uh, this uh, decision support system. And that decision support system it does not allow you to change your sources. You just basically can go on and your model is going to be calibrated to the sources we 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 find. And what happens is they're able to go around their different watersheds and kind of look at the loads and transport. Right. And all, you, now, within that dis, uh, decision support system, you can, in fact, define the spatial area of interest. Yeah, you can define space. Um and to back up a couple of uh, comments from on this, um, in theory, the, the model could be run by anybody um, on PC. Um, the basic code for the model is available from USGS um, website. And I forgot to mention when I started my talk that if you wanted some more information about Sparrow, all you have to do is Google uh, USGS Sparrow. Uh, the first hit on the link on Google will take you to our site. And you can see exactly what we've done in other parts of the country, like the Chesapeake and uh, and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the problem with getting up on an individual PC is getting all these different layers together. Um, the other model uh, to uh, set up a load model to uh, for the calibration and all that. So uh, in most of the country, uh, people have worked with different cooperators to uh, develop. Uh, specific programs um, that might be linked to a TMDL. And once again, if you want to look at our website, you can see some uh, uh, specific applications for that. The model also runs on SAS. Um, that's what we decided. To, that's what USGS decided to use more than a decade ago when we started building this program. SAS is unfortunately an expensive program to operate. Um, if we were starting from scratch today, we probably would use R or something that was open source that would make this. Uh, a little bit more cheaper to um, to use for other people, um, but anyway, that's, um, uh, that that stands. The other thing about the web-based portal that will be of um, use to different people throughout the state or anywhere in the country where this is already applied is that you can run what-if scenarios. So you could pick a you could pick an area of interest, and you could turn some knobs. So you could say like, what happens if um, um, we decrease um, fertilizer amounts by a certain amount, and what will that do to the yield? So that could have some um, utility for, say, a TMDL model or uh, something like that. Um, if manure is transported more efficiently than fiber, um, uh, you change those knobs as well and see what the changes to those are going to be. And once again, you can link downstream sources like the delta or the ocean up to the upstream sources and see um, what the effect is on um, changing the load in a particular area and, um, and see how the downstream uh, body of water um, change in terms of um, how much load they would get. So I think that probably answers that first question as best we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, one was, uh, is there potential in the future to include changes in nitrogen and phosphorus transport downstream and mass flux during storm events? Well, in this particular model, um, the value is really this model is really in terms of what um, what decisions might be made during average flow conditions. It's, 
the model really isn't set up too well to do a uh, mass flux during storm events. That's something that has to be done uh, done separately. So basically, the answer to that question is no. Uh, there are other models available which are probably more uh, valuable in terms of um, looking at uh, changes in storm events. Uh, okay. Now, climate change, though, could be a, a potential for the Sparrow model. So uh, in changes uh, uh, in temperature would affect the uh, potential um, changes in uh, some of the biogeochemical reactions that occur during transport. So, um, and also we could do other scenarios that might affect climate change, like what would happen during changes in discharge, uh, how that might affect the loads downstream. But in terms of being a, a stormwater model, the answer to that would be no. Of another multi uh, set question here. What engine metric is used in calibration to compare the source layers, uh, concentration, load, and over time steps? All right, I think if I understand the question correctly, it's uh, how do we um, highlight a calibration site to an upstream load? And um, basically, we have there the time step would be annual. So we have an annual load for nitrogen uh, and phosphorus when we calibrate that part of the model. And there are potential sources of, um, of nitrogen with throughout the watershed. And um, what we're trying to do essentially during the calibration step, it's a mass per mass calibration. So we're trying to, um, re to relate massive upstream sources uh, that have a potential to move by land to water uh, to the calibration site. And um, we're looking to see like how well we are able to match those, match those sources up. And those uh, diagnostics that Dina was telling you earlier, those uh, p-values, uh, give you an idea of, uh, of how well you're matching up. And then uh, there are other model output that we use uh, to look at this, which is actually uh, as I mentioned, the exact mass that's uh, measured at a calibration site, the potential mass of upstream. And that's something that should be um, uh, close to a one-to-one -one correspondence. So uh, um, the closer it is to a one-to-one -one correspondence, the lower your p-value is going to be. Uh, if your uh, uh, source that you're trying to predict or your delivery variable is incorrect, you might end up with a much higher potential mass going downstream or the amount that's not being accounted for would be much less than what you're seeing downstream. Yeah, residuals. Yeah, and right, and as Dean you know, just mentioned, we also can look at the residuals from the uh, um, versus um, um, observed. So I, I think that answers that question. It's a follow-up on that, that question. What would load contribution by the graph look like the axis was in kilograms over time versus uh, percent. So there'd be two ways to answer that question. So one way would be incrementally um, of what what um, how much load was being transported to an individual watershed. And the way you could look at it is what would be the um, uh, the load transported down to the receiving body of water. So the graph would probably look quite a bit different if we linked the delta up to the upstream sources. So we haven't been able to do that just yet in our prediction. Um, but um, uh, that is, uh, that, that's something that we are uh, looking at futures. We can't really answer that question right now, um, but we'll, we'll see what that looks like as we um, um, develop our our model further. So that's more questions that came up. I just sent you a really long one. Why don't you guys tackle that one? So it's model for storm surface applied to average flows. What time step? We're looking at a yearly time step here. We're, the, the model is um, separated by a year. And that year are all the potential sources that um, are available in that year, um, as well as the discharge and the chemistry data. So the time step is annual. Uh, is fertilizer load and calibration 
looking at the question is fertilizer load and calibration of results, agricultural fertilizer or urban landscaping or both, based on USDA data base, database. Um, so basically, what we're looking at is uh, county level sales. Um, the county level sales that we have, um, uh, they're assigned to uh, crop usage. Uh, we could try to get real fancy and to um, make might even work in a future application by putting by cutting uh, them off into more specific crop types. And in fact, in areas of the, of the in West United States, for example, they were actually to uh, be able to distinguish different crop types like corn or soybeans and, and uh, alfalfa. In California, we've got uh, many crop types, and we were uh, suggested to us by our, uh, people that have worked experience to us in the USGS has done this before was to aggregate all of our nitrogen sources by total ag right now and um, uh, try to think we might be able to uh, tease out some of the other types of uh, crop types as we get more experience with the model. Uh, the urban landscaping um, that is probably covered in the uh, developed land uh, that that Dean explains yeah. on her part of the talk. So uh, those sources would be uh, uh, considered from the urban landscaping. So let's see, the other question is, if I can read this, four land greater than 3,000, four land source, is that your deposition, why not geology? And that's a good question. Um, our, that's the data source that, that we are bringing in is, um, in we actually think this is going to be more important for the phosphorus than it is for the um, for the geology. We mentioned that we thought that the atmospheric position uh, onto the onto forest uh, somewhat of a surrogate for uh, atmospheric deposition. Um, that's partly true, but uh, but obviously the the nitrogen has to cycle through the ecosystem, through the soils, and then through the uh, the runoff from the uh, precipitation into the soil, into the streams. So, um, um, so it's not completely a, a surrogate for atmospheric deposition. As I mentioned, we are in fact bringing in the um, uh, a geology coverage. That would be another uh, another layer, and it's going to be another improvement to the model. Uh, and some areas of the state, uh, particularly uh, as we get into the northeastern part of the state, the Klamath areas. Um, phosphorus is an important geological source. Uh, we'll be bringing that in, and that would also expect it to be an improvement of the model as we uh, get that geological source. So, yes, yeah, definitely a good uh, recommendation. It's something that we are looking at. Then, I'm not sure if I understand this question. Point source is greater than 1,767. Uh, what was the range mm -hmm. of total nitrogen from point sources in milligrams I per don't liter? Know if I uh, yeah, uh, Dina's shaking her head. We don't really have that information uh, available now. Yeah, right off the top of our tongues right now to give to, give to you that. But uh, but basically, what they gave to us was the uh, the flow discharge from a treatment plant, the annual flow for 2001. Uh, in most cases, especially if it was a major uh, wastewater treatment plant, we had the actual nitrogen data and we'll have the actual phosphorus data in most cases. Um, and then we went to the minor plants. Um, not all minor plants had available real data on nitrogen and phosphorus and were estimated using uh, uh, an esti estimation procedure. I, I mean, do you want to add Yeah. The, the, actually, most of, most of the facilities did not have concentration data. I mean, I mean, uh, from all the ones we used, maybe a hundred of them of the majors had uh, concentration data for total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and then the others, uh, then uh, the, from the 185, uh, all 285, we had discharge flow data, and that that was used, incorporated in a program that was developed by the USGS uh, to um, come up with the uh, load uh, from uh, those. Comparing in relation with the amount of discharge that coming out of the facility, so that um, I don't really know them at the top of my head. I have I have processed them and uh, 
this was basically done earlier last year, so I really don't really remember the exact concentration values at this point. Okay. Um, the question, Asher, are you asking for, are they asking for the load? Well, Portia says urban load not high in the SACS for sample no. of percent of all sources. Basically, we showed like a graph yeah. for that with a little, little blip. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I'm not sure if, if the person is asking to have that data, because can we get urban load data from them? I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, in many throughout the country, what you're going to see is that the urban loads are going to be um, relatively smaller relative to all the other loads within the watershed, because basically we're dealing with um, the entire California, of which urban land use is. Uh, a small percent relative to the entire land mass. So it's not too surprising that urban load will look relatively small. But it doesn't mean that uh, urban stormwater sampling should be suspended because the urban load looks, looks small. And of course, uh, uh, sources from uh, urban sources can be really important uh, to local stream sources. So just because we're showing a, a small urban load in this model, it doesn't necessarily imply that these are not important sources. It just basically implies that compared to all the other potential sources, the bad urban load is relatively small. Okay. So the TP model in yeah. progress, what right answer TP, the TP model is um, actually almost, I mean, um, have all layers to put together. The only layer that we're missing at this point, and it's in, uh, we're kind of just waiting as a matter of time. Uh, the geology layer to show the background uh, phosphorus concentration. Um, so, uh, as far as uh, how many calibration sites, at this point we have uh, 85 calibration sites for total phosphorus. Um, this number could increase or decrease based on the results from the model. I mean, once we put in the model, like with, with total nitrogen, we started off with 105 sites. And you, you run them through and you have to evaluate the model the results based on. Uh, your comparison with your looking at your residuals. There's a whole like a set of statistics that you go through to decide whether to use those calibration sites or not. So it has to be removed uh, in order uh, once we're in the process of calibration. So at this point we have 85 sites for TP. Uh, we might get more sites from Klamath. Uh, once we include the Tahoe Basin, we'll get like at least those 13, uh, maybe more. At the end of the day, I'm not really sure how many we'll end up. With when uh, once the model is ready and ca and calibrated, uh, and that we should be you know we should find out within a couple of months what's going on and how the model is going to look. Yeah, I'll address the slide. Is it such they include the Monterey Formation or other petroleum source rock in at least um, one of the model sites? And uh, I'm not sure exactly where the person is is that question. Although I would encourage them to send me an email. <laughs> I actually would like to talk some about that. Um, the Monterey is actually starting to be a little bit more on our radar screen here as an organization with the uh, potential for the um, enhanced oil recovery that's going to be going on Monterey, uh, expect over the next few years. Um, but I'm sure exactly how um, exactly what the Monterey would help us out in this, unless it was a, a large potential source of nitrogen to stream, which it very might very well be. So uh, if uh, if the person that that wrote that question contacted me separately, I'd love to talk to them about that a little bit more and see what they what, what they were doing on on that. Okay. with that. And then what was that final question down here? A question on urban loads is just if we just can get urban load data comparison with local. Uh, this, I mean they're looking at look at getting the urban load data the results from the model. Um, and point I don't think it's uh, available make, uh, soon once we're done with it and uh, we're done with all the different fine tuning that we want to do to it. And uh, you can also feel feel free to contact uh, Joe or me 